can't get in. It's down. The question is, does anybody from OHA know whether OPERA is down? That's our case investigation data system. Yes, Con confirming um, we're having uh, an outage right now. Okay, thank you. Normally I get an email and I didn't see one. And anyway, I've had problems in the past on my end. So I was just wondering where to start. Thank you. Sure, uh, Dean, I don't know if you have more to add on Opera access today. Um, um, I just got on, so I didn't hear the question, but um, we did have an unfortunate opera crash um, earlier. I think it's coming back up, but um, yeah, that's why our, we will have some significant fixes over the weekend. Um, so hopefully this won't happen again. So sorry, Charity. Yeah, I got the email earlier and I thought it was back and I just tried to log in to enter a new case and it's not letting me, but um, I'll just wait till the morning. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and start um, because we have a lot of uh, great present presenters tonight. Um, it's good to be with you all tonight again. Um, I want to welcome all the folks who are also tuning in via our live stream as well. Um, each of your public comments um, are shared with the VAC members weekly. So thank you for, for all those comments. Um, before we start, I also wanted to thank um, a few of our VAC members, um, Daisy, Kalani, um, Marin, and Kelly, um, all of whom yesterday gave testimony before the Senate Committee on Healthcare um, at the Oregon Legislature. And so uh, Chair Patterson wanted to have information on vaccine distribution, particularly particularly around what is being done to ensure there's an equitable sequencing and access. And so I was able to watch the live stream and I'm really just grateful that our four colleagues on the VAC were able to share their thoughts and how the process has been. So, so thank you to them. Uh, for attendance tonight, if I could have folks go ahead and put your pronouns in the chat function, that would be great. Um, again, my name's New. I go by she, her pronouns. Um, a couple of uh, notes for tonight's meeting. Um, about the Zoom technology, I want to suggest that folks look at their viewing settings. If you're having, if you've been having difficulty with how slide presentations or note taking have been showing up on your screens, um, we would encourage you to check on your view um, for the Zoom settings. Um, if you have difficulties tonight, if you could reach out to, I'm gonna suggest um, Jamila and Kristen Darmody. Um, they both have hosting capabilities. And so um, if you have uh, issues tonight, please reach out to them. Also tonight, I'm gonna try um, going with a, a little something different. I'm going to ask that we limit the use of the chat chat function. And I know I just asked you guys to put something in the chat, so bad on me. Um, but I'm going to ask us to limit the use of the chat function slightly. Um, we've had a really robust conversations over the last few weeks. Um, and really to ensure that we hear from everyone on the VAC and not miss anything, I'm going to ask that we don't have um, parallel co conversations tonight and see how that goes. So if you want to make a comment or have a question, um, um, please use the raise your hand function or type in the word question or comment in the chat. And so that'll help us to be able to call on you. Um, I also am going to ask that we save our questions towards um, after the presentations so that we can get a full, um, full presentation from our guests tonight. Um, I, I do recognize that for some of you who prefer to use the chat function, this may feel uh, restrictive. So please reach out to me after tonight and let me know your thoughts on that and if it did or didn't work for you. So um, we, wanna, we want this to be a very inclusive space where all modes of engagement are respected. And so please do reach out to me um, if that didn't quite work for you so well. Um, 
As far as introductions goes, um, I know that there have been several different opportunities already that VAC members have reached out to OHA staff to communicate and engage in dialogue um, with communities. So tonight's presentation I think is really um, timely. Um, we're going to be focusing on communication and community engagement. So I wanna um, go ahead and welcome our presenters tonight. We have Kristen Darmody, who you all have been working with. She supports the VAC in a lot of different ways. She is part of the COVID Response Recovery Unit, which we affectionately call CREW. Um, we also have two folks from the Community Partnership and Outreach Program. We'll be hearing from Jorge Martinez Zapata and then Crystal Marion. So we're really glad to have these folks. Um, when, when they wrap up, we'll take some questions um, after they, they finish presenting. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'm gonna pause and give a chance for Kristen to go ahead and pull up her slides um, and start the presentation on community engagement tonight. Thank you so much, New. Uh, this is Kristen. And um, I think you all should be able to see my screen now, hopefully, and with the slides that we're going to be sharing this evening. So it's my pleasure to be with you tonight to share with you a little bit about our community engagement strategy and efforts for the COVID vaccine. And I will ask my colleague Jamila to um, help us with this next slide. Absolutely. Um my name is Jamila Norton, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm going to read uh, this tribal lands acknowledgement, but also I'd like to um, say that this um, was written um, when we were working from uh, our building in Portland, and uh, we're working to create a broader um, uh, tribal lands acknowledgement for the state when we're in um, conversations and meetings like this. Uh, we acknowledge that we are, we acknowledge that what we now call Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County are the ancestral lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Hamlet, Clackamas, Hallett, Band of Canuck, Wallatin, Halupa, Malawa, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette rivers. We are here because this land was occupied and its traditional people were displaced by colonists and settlers. As settlers and or guests, we recognize the strong and diverse native communities in our region today from tribes both local and distant and offer respect and gratitude for their stewardship of these lands throughout the generation. Thank you, Jamila. And now to frame our work from a place of equity and reaffirm OHA's commitment to community, I would ask my colleague Kara to um, read these slides. Thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> so Kara Biddlecombe with OHA and she, her. OHA acknowledges that there are institutional, systemic, and structural barriers that perpetuate inequity and have silenced the voices of communities over time. OHA is committed to partnerships, co-creation, and co-ownership of solutions with communities disproportionately affected by health issues so that they can actively participate in planning, implementing, and evaluating efforts to address health issues. OHA recognizes community-engaged health improvement is a long-term and dynamic process. OHA is striving to engage with communities through deliberate, structured, emerging, and best practice processes. OHA is striving to make engagement with public health effective for communities, especially those communities that experience institutional, systemic, and structural barriers. Thank you, Kara. And um, I wanted to share that there is historical context that um, also frames our community engagement work. 
many individuals and communities have generational trauma and mistrust of government and health systems. We must take into account the experiences of harm and fear that are grounded in systemic racism and systemic ableism. The historical and current inequities experienced by individuals and communities shape their perspectives on the COVID vaccine, and we cannot discount this fact. Governmental public health must work to ensure access to services, care, safe vaccination pathways, and transparency. And that's the space from which we are beginning this work and where we are grounded in the work that we are doing um, for community enge engagement. So the Public Health Division's community engagement efforts started with the COVID-19 response. Since July, OHA has been working to develop a strong network of community-based organizations and local public health authorities to provide culturally and linguistically responsive COVID-19 community engagement, contact tracing, and wraparound services. This is work now that, that we're doing. This is work that we've been planning for. Uh, the cross-agency community engagement vaccine team was established in November 2020 and includes staff from across the agency. The vaccine planning unit includes communications, equity analysts embedded in each work stream, a team lead for community engagement, and an overall equity manager. Alongside this work, the Public Health Division's Policy and Partnerships team manages grants with community-based organizations and local and tribal public health. Staff are assigned groups of community-based organizations and local public health authorities and have been working since July to build relationships at the local level. Additional funds will be provided to these partners out of the new federal package. So just a little background about this work. So two of the teams that are most active in community partnerships here at OHA are organized to work with partners on a regional basis. This slide shows a map of the Public Health Division's community engagement coordinators who work with the community-based organizations who have received the grants as I just mentioned. Additionally, the Community Partner Outreach Program with over 10 years of relationship building experience has a team of, a robust team, excuse me, of regional outreach coordinators. They work closely with a well-established network of community partners serving those who have been most affected by the pandemic. So their efforts um, within the Community Partner Outreach Program work to connect eligible folks with Oregon Health Plan coverage, which um, continues to be a great need and the community partners this network um, is continuing to respond to that as well as with other needs. Now that much of our COVID response attention is directed toward vaccines, the infrastructure to connect with communities includes support from staff to build these relationships with trusted partners, um, our community-based organization grants, external technical assistance for our partners, regular partner calls, kind of general COVID-19 informational and listening sessions, as well as specific engagement uh, with communities to hear their questions um, about vaccines. And of course, you all, the Vaccine Advisory Committee uh, form an important part of um, this community engagement work. When it comes to vaccines, it's been very important for us to engage intentionally with specific communities. Um, communities that have been most affected by the pandemic, communities that, are, that have faced historical as well as current health inequities and injustices. OHA needs to hear and understand the questions, concerns, priorities, and, and needs of different constituencies around vaccines. Our team has been reaching out to partners to hold community dialogue including um, the different communities that are listed on this slide, different groups, constituencies, and partners um, that uh, represent or serve people within these spaces. And more conversations are in the works as well with other groups. Certain principles guide our work, of course. Um, we know that this work moves at the speed of trust. We're building relationships. We're seeking understanding. Also, elevating community wisdom is central to this work. It's community-driven. It is not agency-driven. 
also, this work is never um, one and done. Uh, we are valuing long-term accountable relationships that serve the needs of community where they are. In short, by working with community, we hope to bring together feedback, data, and ideas to continuously improve the way OHA is responding to COVID. Our team elevates community voices, insights, and experiences to inform policy and practice changes. And some of the ways that we've done this, uh, we've listed on this slide. Community-based organizations, community partners have told us what they need. Funding, input into message creation, adaptation of OHA's materials. So we have adapted the way that we're doing things to fit the reality of what our community partners need, trying to really be responsive to what partners are telling us. And we are continuously adapting. It's a way of working. It's not a one-off outcome. So we are changing the way that we do business to respond to communities. So that is our very brief um, background into our community engagement efforts. And um, I uh, will turn it over to New to um, provide our, um, our next portion of, uh, or the uh, introduction to um, my colleagues. Sure, thank you, Kristen. I'm gonna have both Jorge and Crystal introduce themselves. These are our folks that are working with the Community Partnership Outreach Program. And so they're gonna be sharing some um, insights on things that they've been hearing from the community through, through their work and their efforts. So um, Jorge or Crystal, uh, is it Jorge, you'll be starting us off? Yeah, I think so, thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, my name is Jorge Martinez Zapata. I'm a regional outreach coordinator for Northeast Oregon. You can see the counties I serve there. I work for the community partner outreach program at OHA. Good evening. My name is Crystal Marion and I am a community outreach and engagement coordinator with the CPOP program. And my work is specifically with the black African-American, African immigrant, um, African refugee communities. This is Kristen again. I wanted to just make a quick note before we get into the presentations from Jorge and Crystal that they're going to be presenting two examples of community engagement that continue through vaccine distribution. There are many other efforts underway with other communities and partners. OHA commits to working with community and VAC members to engage all populations prioritized by VAC and systematically affected by COVID. And now Jorge, over to you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just want to say thank you to to this committee, um, to all leadership um, at OHA, to the crew, everyone, the governor for uh, really keeping equity in mind with regard to to this this, this community. So I just want to say thank you uh, first and foremost. Secondly, I wanted to share a, a quick story. Uh, to kind of frame the context of what we're we're dealing with here um, and what disparity exists uh, with, with this community. Um, back in May, I was approached, I was called by a woman uh, out on the coast. Uh, um, she was of uh, uh, Latinx descent um, and she worked in food processing out on the coast. And she called me and said that she had recently been fired from her job because she went and got tested for COVID. She tested positive and they told her if she didn't come back to work, she was gonna get fired. Um, they ended up firing her. On top of it, she had cancer. So she had cancer and COVID at the same time, and now she was jobless, without insurance, without wages, having to feed her family. So this is the existence of some of these migrant seasonal farm workers or food processing workers that, that live here in Oregon. I just wanted to, to put that out there and kind of frame what we're dealing with here, um, the amount of disparity that exists in this community. So. Um, that being said, um, you know, the OHA and the crew and the state and the, all agencies have done really great work to reach out to this community. Um, and these aren't all inclusive. The, these aren't all of the efforts that we have put forth, but they're some of the highlights, some of the important highlights that pertain specifically to this, this community. Um, and so one of those is PPE distribution, obviously getting masks, getting hand sanitizer out to the community directly. 
um, putting it in their hands. That's been uh, that's been facilitated by the crew, Akiko Saito at the crew. She's been critical in resourcing that and giving us the capacity to be able to get it to our community partners. So that's one of the big efforts. The other one is uh, another one is is targeted testing. Uh, these are community testing events that specifically target people of color, marginalized communities, including migrant seasonal farm workers. Um, another highlight is the culturally responsive communications and materials. Uh, Kristen herself has been instrumental in developing a lot of our, our community partner calls, including the migrant seasonal farm worker call, which is managed now by CPOP. Liliana Villanueva and Maria Castro have been instrumental in, 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 in that. Uh, that component, uh, but we've developed printed materials in multiple languages, including indigenous languages uh, uh, that, that, that uh, the migrant seasonal farm workers speak. Uh, another component is the wraparound services, of course, all the England's team and the money that was put out, those, those grants that, that Kristen was talking about. Um, you know, it's, it's important that we provide those wage replacement resources to people um, that, that, that when they participate in testing or if they lose their job, if they're underemployed, that they have uh, some kind of, of uh, wage replacement to cover those, the, to survive the storm, to weather the storm. Um, and then, you know, of course, outreach and education, educating people about, um, the, you know, um, how to how to prevent prevention uh, strategies on, on on how to prevent getting COVID. Um, so those are uh, some of the highlights um, that that we've been working on at the crew. Um, now, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the community partner outreach program has been the sort of backbone to this work, um, and um, we received three million dollars to do. Uh, outreach and education campaign to uh, farm workers specifically. And this was given us to us to us from Governor Brown as part of the Food Security and Farm Worker Safety Program. Uh, and this happened around May or June, but we were given $3 million. And what we did was we reached out to culturally specific uh, um, partners around the state. And it's important to note that the that, that CPOP we have a huge network of community partners that we work with. Uh, typically what we do is OHP uh, uh, services to the community. And so through that, that network, we were able to identify these partners that could work very specifically with this population. Uh, so we, we contracted with 16 partners around the state. Um, and they've, these are the four areas here that you see of, of work that they've been, that, that this campaign has been focused on. The first uh, has been field outreach to people going to their houses, going to farms, going to their churches, going to where they're at to be able to educate them about um, COVID-19 uh, and, and help them on the prevention side of things. So that's been the, the, the one of the, the primary components. These folks are out there in people's faces talking to them about COVID-19. And so far they've reached, as of December, uh, our reports show that they've 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 reached over 25,000 farm workers face to face. Another component, the uh, uh, critical component, important component of this campaign has been the the media, the culturally specific media uh, through Lara Media, through Viva Northwest. Uh, this this population uh, is difficult to reach by nature, but there are some some media outlets, some media. Uh, uh, channels that they, they they utilize primarily radio tv and social media so we're focused on that uh, through companies that have a rich history of, of reaching these these communities so uh, that's another critical component is that very targeted culturally specific uh, media communications um, and then of course the ppe distribution our partners are the ones that distribute that ppe right the ppe that we get from the crew um, and and by, by our counts, they've distributed over 150,000 individual pieces of PPE as of December. Uh, of course, that's of December. There's been a lot of work done since then as well. So we continue to distribute that PPE, which is really great, uh, really important and um, and expanding that effort. Um, the last one, of course, is um, the community testing events, you know, drive-through testing events, uh, outreach testing and H2A testing. The drive-through testing events, um, you know, we've been working in conjunction with uh, operations at the crew, Cassie Clark, 
um, and Aaron, uh, I forget his last name, I apologize, but um, Aaron Dunn uh, at, at, the, uh, at the crew to be able to set up these events across the state. Um, and they're targeting, you know, uh, marginalized communities and, and they have operations throughout all the state. Um, and that started uh, back in July, June, July, I wanna say. Um, and, um, but also the outreach testing that we've done, very specific, again, that very specific targeted one-time testing, for example, going to a, uh, a labor contractor that hires a lot of migrant seasonal farm workers, that type of, of testing. And then of course the H2A testing, um, where we go to farms and do rapid Binax testing to test the, uh, the uh, the workers as they arrive from from wherever they're coming from in the world. We've done three of those so far. There's about 15 of them on the horizon. There's about 85 outreach testing events that we've now developed and are, are working with the testing team to be able to deliver. We're also doing that in conjunction with the University of Oregon. Uh, so we're kind of combining uh, resources, forces, if you will, to be able to deliver these outreach testing events. But we've done, uh, uh, three testing events, H2A testing events so far, and we did prevent, uh, we did capture one. We've tested about 80 uh, workers that have come in from another from other countries, and we did uh, catch one um, positive. And so we were able to, to, to help identify that person and have them isolate, not mix in with the rest of, of the domestic workers. So it's a really, um, to me, that's a win. That's why we're doing this work, right? That's why, and, and it's it's important to highlight that because that's exactly why we're doing it. That's why exa it's exactly important. If this person had, um, you know, mixed with the domestic workers, um, you know, they, who knows what could have happened really. So um, so those are the four components of, of, of what we have going uh, in terms of the community partner outreach program. This is where the rubber meets the road, if you will. This is the work being done on the ground. And it certainly isn't everything, but it is uh, one of the, the, the key pieces to this, this migrant seasonal farm worker response at OHA and the crew. Um, and so next slide, please. <clears throat> And so what does all of this mean, of course? You know, what we've learned is that this is a very, continues to be a very marginalized community. Um, and all of this has been amplified by the pandemic. These people get, uh, th this community keeps getting pushed further and further out into the periphery. They lack less and less, they have less and less access to resources, to testing, to information, to healthcare services, to, to uh, health, whatever it may be, right? Um, and, and all of that has just been ampl amplified by the, the, by the pandemic. And so it's, it's critical. Um, what I wanna leave you all with is that this is one of the most um, marginalized, um, vulnerable communities in the state of Oregon. Um, they, they have a lot of health disparities within them. Um, they, yet they, they help Oregon's economy so much. Um, and, and they do it without complaining. They're all very humble people. They're all very humble people. And so I think it's incumbent upon us. It's, it's, it's critical uh, for, for the VAC and for OHA and for the crew to continue to, to uh, provide these services to prioritize them both in testing and vaccination. Um, and, and that would be my ask to this group is, is to consider incorporating uh, migrant seasonal farm workers into the, the 1B portion of the rollout plan. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the story I shared with you at the beginning, these, this is the type of disparity that these, the, these folks are dealing with. And, it, and they are critical to Oregon's economy. They are critical they're a part of our social fabric. Um, they're part of our economy. They live in Oregon. Uh, they contribute to our society. So um, that, that's all I have. Uh, thank you again, once again for the opportunity to share new. Thank you to Kristen uh, very much for the invitation. That's all I got, thanks. Good evening, again, my name is Crystal Marion and I am the Community Engagement and uh, Outreach Coordinator for the Community Partner Outreach Program. And I wanted, before I started, just to kind of give you a little bit of background about my work. And um, prior to working with CPOP, I um, 
actually worked in the Office of Equity and Inclusion, providing executive support um, to division leadership and office management, then working in the community engagement team, um, actually directly providing contract administration for the community-based organizations who are receiving, who have received funding for community engagement, um, rep services and contact tracing. And now I'm with the Community Partner Outreach Program um, in this role, specifically supporting the uh, Black, African-American, African immigrant and African refugee communities. Now I wanted to kind of communicate that so that the work and um, the voices, you know, just to make sure that it's an understanding that it's their work that I'm supporting, it's their voices that I'm here to support and elevate. Um, some of the work in which I'm doing are community outreach and engagement efforts. Um, so at the onset of the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation between community elders, OHA and ODHS leadership. And from those conversations, both OHA and ODHS developed um, a plan of action. And OHA's plan of action included data collection, testing and prevention strategies, community-centered outreach, and education and support for increased behavioral needs. Now, one thing I want you to do is think back on, there's this visual that we saw in one of the slides earlier that um, was listed as engage, listen, do the work, share back, evaluate, course correct, and back to engaging the communities. Um, and, it, and it just continues. Now, one of the things that I think is important is that this is, like she stated, is not a one-time thing. Um, no way do we go and talk with communities and then that's it, no more. Um, I'm constantly engaging with the community via community check-ins, um, work groups to listen for what the community concerns are and how we can together address the issues and concerns. It is critical that we hear and learn from those um, whose lives our policies and work directly impact. I've been able to engage with over a hundred community organizations um, including faith-based organizations as well. And the work that I'm doing has only been since August of uh, 2020. Wanna make sure that that's stated. So um, hit the ground running. <laughs> Some of the uh, work includes testing and prevention strategies. Um, OHA, we've held several testing strategies within or testing events within uh, the black churches have hosted several events as well as community-based organizations. Our testing staff is currently working um, with CBOs to put on, to host another event that's coming up soon, um, the Urban League, Portland First Avenue Baptist Church and SEI. They're also working to determine final locations and logistics for search uh, testing, um, which is um, providing up to 10,000 COVID-19 tests. Um, and then also personal protective equipment, PPE, we um, are constantly putting out information to make sure that our, the communities that we're serving or the communities that we're engaging with have opportunities to receive uh, PPE. And we have to date since um, as of middle of December have provided over 82,624 pieces of PPE. Now in regards to um, connection to resources and information, um, that is not a work that I do in a vacuum. I coordinate across the state systems, ODHS, especially for the DD services and self-sufficiency programs and a wonderful treasure that I have found in, a, in um, Brenda Pearson, the state business partnerships coordinator who has who's key in identifying additional opportunities for community-based organizations to be able to um, partner with the state. And of course, um, other divisions and programs within OHA um, to do this work, such as the CEC team who administers the contracts for the services we talked about in regards to RAP services, contract tracing and community education. And also um, OEI, Office of Equity Inclusion. And that's specifically in regards to language access because even um, within it's the Black, African, American, African immigrant and refugee community. There are several languages within the African community, which um, the community has indicated has been really difficult to be able to get um, information to their community that's not translated. Um, and I believe we are now in the process of doing some of that work and translating in those four, the three languages to, and I, I do not want to pronounce them wrong, Oromo, uh, 
Hamrick and Tigrinya are the, the um, languages that were specific um, from the community. So we, I work with all these different organizations within OHA to ensure that we are um, providing the services support that the community is requesting. I also work in collaboration with Multnomah County, and um, of course, I'm consistent in ongoing communication with the community partners. Slide, uh, next slide, please. Some um, continued engagement efforts. So at every step of the way, it's important for me to be able to listen to the community in every meeting, in every conversation, they are telling us how to best communicate and get information to them. And they are expressing their concerns regarding uh, COVID-19 and uh, the vaccine. And they're also talking about their interest in having trusted community partners uh, participate in the distribution of the vaccine. But I wanna, I wanna uh, back up just a minute. Um, each month, OHA and ODHS leadership hosts a meeting with community regarding COVID-19 impact. And during one of those meetings, and um, I think it was just around the time that the vaccine, um, uh, information in regards to the vaccine started kind of coming out and going back to that visual of engage, listen, and so on and so forth. The community started sending me, I've received over hundreds of emails saying that what they wanted for the next meeting was to have a listening session regarding the vaccine. So at that point, um, I was able to work with uh, Kristen Darmody who leads the uh, role in being able to set the December session as a listening session. And again, listening to community um, by way of emails and community check-ins I had a lot of initial information that the community was requesting to have for that listening session. And we were able to actually, um, with work, working with Kristen Darmody and the immunization managers, were able to put together an actual listening session specific to what the community asks were. And um, the information we received from that engagement also then shaped the community vaccine form we had, that was in uh, just last week, actually. We had two, one was for the faith community specifically, and then the other was for the um, overall community. And um, at that time, after the engagement, um, the actual vaccine form, we also held space for community to be able to come together and to have what we call a continue the conversation. And it was during this time, during uh, that, continue the conversation where the community was able to talk to and, and pretty much process the information that they had received during the um, actual forum. And some of the, um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Some of the um, conversations that came up from that actual continue the conversation, I want to be able to, and I went to my notes as um, just to be able to express exactly what the community had said in regards to the vaccine. And they said, if you have an opportunity, and this is before I knew that I was going to be presenting to you, but my notes, um, and I wrote specifically, if you have an opportunity, please tell the VAC, the Vic Vaccine Advisory Committee, tell them number one, and these are direct notes from um, what the community said. Our communities are dying. The prioritization of our community is paramount and our trust level is very low. We need prioritization as well as distribution to occur within our own communities. There has to be ways to ensure the community can participate in this process. And then number two, I mean, there. There were several, but these are just the three that I chose to read tonight. Please look at how providing vaccinations to a group might impact another. For example, we have generations of families living under one roof. If children are permitted to go to school, they will return home to families that consist of three plus generations who are not able to receive the vaccination at the same time. And number three, I like the fact that we're having these conversations. It's important. We need to make sure that we are targeting other pockets of our population that do not have access to technology 
and all and the way in which we're getting the information. Let's continue this, but let's make sure that we are also still targeting other communities within our population. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jorge and Crystal. Um, as you all can hear, um, this, there's a really phenomenal team that's doing this work to engage communities and to uplift and amplify community voices. Um, I wanted to briefly share with you here the, some, of, some of the many ways that we are engaging and working with communities. Um, we are always looking for new ways to work together. So some of the um, options that, that we are currently utilizing right now um, are informational webinars for community partners in both English and Spanish, um, regular listening sessions where community partners bring their ideas and insights. And both of those are opportunities that are, that are open to broadly to community partners. It's an open invitation to folks to participate. Um, there is also um, a, a um, partner webinar uh, specifically for um, those community partners working with migrant and seasonal farm workers. It's a really fantastic um, opportunity that is um, managed by our colleagues in the Community Partner Outreach Program and the Office of Equity and Inclusion, doing great work with those specific communities. Um, there are also uh, really great informational events um, that are uh, produced by OHA on Facebook Live. They include OHA leadership and senior health advisors um, speaking on a variety of different topics. And those, again, are available to anyone um, with an internet connection to, to check those out. Uh, our team is also available to participate in um, community-sponsored, community-organized events, community meetings, staff meetings, forums, classes, uh, faith community discussions. Um, we want to make sure that we are hearing, as Crystal said, from the people uh, who are um, affected by the policies that OHA is um, putting into practice. We are also very open to other ideas. Uh, we want to know what the community needs and be responsive to it. And with that, um, this concludes our portion of uh, presentations th this evening. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Kristen, Crystal, and Jorge. We so appreciate the time that you put together um, this information for us. I'm going to go ahead and start um, asking questions um, from the chat. I know a couple of you have already reached out and want to ask some questions. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start with the, the chat right now. Um, first of all, it looks like Zenya has the question, um, Oregon has about uh, 100K Slavic religious refugees. This population is bigger than the African American and indigenous populations, but OHA continues to overlook them. It's the single biggest minority group after Spanish speakers suffer from tremendous um, inequities in health outcomes. They've been hit very hard by COVID at rates that are similar to other minorities. What can I do to help OHA recognize this unique Oregon situation? This population of religious refugees continues to be overlooked. And no, I, I appreciate you reading my comment in its entirety. I did not want this to come across as pitting minorities against each other. I think somebody mentioned that. Yes. Not at all. There's, a, there's clearly a tremendous historic and current injustice being committed against the members of the Black and Indigenous communities. And recent immigrants are not subject to those forces. This is not a competition. This is more of an acknowledgement that Oregon is the only state in the United States that has this very unique demographic where 100,000 people are living, they look white, they don't speak English very well, and they have tremendous mistrust of the healthcare system, um, and re they've been hit extremely hard by COVID. At one point in Multnomah County, uh, there's approximately one to two percent of Oregonians are, of you know, in this pop in this population. But 
several weeks ago, I was in a call with Multnomah County and they shared that 20% of uh, all of the um, white, quote unquote, white admits were Slavic. I mean, that suggests a rate of 10 times the ex or 20 times the expected infection. So this was more a reaction to this presentation that none of the slides called out this very sizable and very significant problem that we don't actually have a strategy for addressing because it's a very insular community that does not have these wonderful community engagement organizations that other communities have built up because they're pretty recent and they're invisible and it's a big problem. I don't have a solution, but I do want to make sure we begin to recognize this unique Oregon situation. Thank you, Zhenya. Um, I appreciate that comment and just jumping in and clarifying everything. Also, I know that um, tonight's presenters really did focus on two specific areas, um, you know, uh, throughout their presentation. So thank you for that. Um, I know you also had a question about the number of workers, um, seasonal and migrant workers in Oregon. Perhaps we can get that information to you, to the group, um, um, and get that out as part of our minutes as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge that Lori also agreed with you about not um, being being very careful not to pit underserved um, groups against one another. And then I know that um, we have more questions. And um, Dr. Raphael, I believe you're up for a question. Thank you. Um, hi, Crystal and Jorge. Thanks so much for sharing and for your great work in the community. That's really, really very important and uh, just thanks so much. Um, I, I wanted to know um, about vaccine distribution into the communities that you're serving. Um, are, are there discussions that you're already having with OHA about, or OHA, sorry, uh, about how to get the vaccines um, into those areas, a lot, some of which are rural con given like the the cold temperature requirements and storage and like scheduling people for two visits to get a vaccine. Um, the, the reason why I ask is I, I think that this is going to be an effective way to vaccinate the population that I'm representing, which is the Pacific Islander community. Um, but I just don't know like if those discussions are happening with OHA and how, how successful you think, you know, those types of programs would be. Sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. Like, uh, like considering these logistical challenges, like which kind of setting would be appropriate to vaccinate? Just like like rural, like getting vaccines into rural communities, or like vaccinating people at, um, you know, community events that are organized, like at a at a church or something like that. You know, those were things that were real successful for the PI community. But like with the, the just like the the cold temperature requirements and things like that and getting the people and the, you know, someone to monitor them for half an hour after their vaccine and scheduling them for their first shot. And then their second shot, like there's a lot of, it's more difficult than just actually testing somebody. Um, so have, what kinds of discussions have been done about that? And is that even feasible to do like at a, at a church or something like that? Um, it certainly could be possible. We're just anticipating that this might um, take a little bit of time in terms of resourcing CBOs to be able to do this work and also just kind of, you know, giving them like the training and the appropriate tools to be able to do it because like you said, it's mostly the storage requirements. Moderna is a little easier than Pfizer. So um, we have some early discussions on how this would roll out. It wouldn't be something that OHA would supervise directly. It would be something that we'd coordinate with local jurisdictions to be able to do that. But we would um, probably focus on the healthcare system, like so FQHC clinics, uh, primarily serving large numbers of priority populations first and then kind of go from there. So that's kind of where we sat so far. And local public health um, departments are, are are, I have a hard time saying, are already doing this. Um, so I work really closely with um, three relatively rural counties, Columbia, Tillamook, and Clatsop counties. And we're having um, very concrete conversations about um, everything that you talked about, including um, partnership with local CBOs and what role they can play right now. 
logistically, <laughs> they're trying to set up just the base infrastructure. And so logistically, it's um, more about uh, when the time comes, how do you tar uh, do targeted culturally specific outreach to communities and partnership with um, CBOs. Um, and then seeing where they'll be safe, uh, feel safe. Sorry, I've, um, one sec. Where, where, where they'll be um, like trying to get them to the um, events that are happening. The three counties aren't doing big mass events because there's just not enough vaccine. And some of the counties have specifically chosen to do it in certain ways because they feel like the communities might be hesitant and they'll feel safer getting it in a clinic that's right now and then they're thinking about that same concept where are other way places that they'll be that they'll feel safe one, one sec sweetie that they'll be um feel safe to get it so i just wanted to say that um organizations or local public health departments are are absolutely doing and they have more of the direct relationships to the cbo's um on the ground so i think that's going to be um, a big opportunity and a place where um, where a lot of this on the grounds work will will happen with advisement of the expertise that OHA has. Thank you, Safina. Jorge, Thanks. did you want to jump in and answer in, um, the question? Uh, yeah, just you know, really briefly, I think that you know OHA, um, you know, we are taking into consideration all of the the feedback from the community partners to help inform that. And I think that, you know, what Shimi was saying about access points like FQHCs and things like that are absolutely critical. And we've built that into the plan. Maria Castro, my colleague has done this work with me. She's built that into a plan that we're gonna be proposing to, uh, to OHA and the crew to be able to, to operationalize things. But yeah, there's, and the crew has already um, established a lot of operations around testing that can either be duplicated or leveraged to be able to do that outreach style vaccination. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly um, obstacles and barriers with that, but it has to be informed by the, 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 the partners on where to do it. And um, we have to go to where the people are at. We cannot rely on on traditional um, distribution methods. Yeah. We have to go to where people are at, where they live, where they socialize, where they work if possible. So absolutely, yeah. Great, thank you. And, and then I wanna just make a quick comment in the um, the chat. Sering, did you wanna make your comment about schools reopening? Do you wanna unmute and make that comment? No, I just put it in the chat because I didn't wanna take the time, but I was pretty much agreeing to the comment that was made and also the comments that I've been reading uh, from the community members that are presented to the VAC. Okay, thank you. Sandy, you have a question. I do. In just over a week, we're going to start vaccinating many, many thousands of seniors in our state. And I would like to know what specific outreach efforts are happening right now to make sure we access the seniors in the state because there's a lot of them who aren't going to be watching webinars or looking at Facebook. In fact, I think we can guess many of them, especially the older ones will not. So, you know, we can't really wait. What are we doing right now, today? Well, and, and I guess I have a question on that. If we're gonna do it by age, are we gonna also do it by race and ethnicity or is that not even part of that? Um, if, we're, if we are doing this to try to get the people that really need it, how do we get those people at that age group to go there? I mean, if, the, if it's gonna be divided by age, I mean, I think that when we get to the, this point, we need to get the, the people, I mean, all people in, and how do you get all people in and how do you advertise? I mean, I think with the same thing, Sandra, I mean, is how, what kind of advertisement is going on that we can get all the people at that age group in? That, because if you've seen the data, the data is saying that that um, ethnic minorities are not getting their vaccines, right? The, the higher minority, the, uh, the the bigger the white minor people are the ones getting the, the vaccines, and our, the ethnic minorities are not. So we're not, and we're here to try to put that together and say, how do we get our ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities in for vaccines, even if they do it by age? How do we get them? Because that is it. That is exactly the point I was making, Maria. Yes. How do we reach the populations who yes. aren't 
going to naturally be going and we, we need to be starting yes. February 7th. Is it that we're going to start yeah, vaccinating I seniors? Seen, yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen a plan. Yeah. One of the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, just Crystal, a, please. I'm just, just thinking based on some um, conversations with community, one of the things that I know is critical that community is asking for, and we're trying to make sure that we're being able to off offer as many opportunities to have conversations in regards to the vaccine, because there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy within our community. So community organizations, um, Urban League, um, Children's Community Clinic, they're offering opportunities to be able to open up to start having conversations broadly um, with as many people. They're putting together packets, they're delivering things. So, I mean, they're working within certain pockets to get information out because even though there's a vaccine, you still have people who may not want to take that vaccine based on um, historical trauma, based on just his history in general. So offering as much communication um, educating the community in regards to the vaccine is crucial. And that's the pieces that we're working with trying, excuse me, trying to ensure that community is having the conversations regularly. So that's, and, and, I, and I can't really speak to how we get them there, but I can speak to the fact of trying to make sure that we are offering the opportunities to, in, to have the conversations. So and then, and the community can actually work on, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna, and there are some community members willing to set up work groups to be able to, to talk about that very point. How do we make sure that the seniors are getting to the vaccinations? Or how can we be able to take vaccinations and have churches be able to distribute the vaccinations? How can we have community organizations get ready to be able to, to, be able to do this work? And so we're not having to constantly take, have people go out people that don't drive, people that don't have transportation, people who are, um, for whatever reason, cannot get to where they need to go. So that those conversations are, are happening and it's just, we need to continue those conversations um, between now and that time so that people can hear what they need to hear to be able to make a, an informed decision on what to do. This is Musay, can I pipe in? Uh, yes, Musay, please. Thank you very much. I kind of want to tag along what uh, Chris was talking about, which is it, it's not only we have a high risk community, but also as a high hesitancy community. And part of it is also, uh, especially in the immigrant refugee black community, also they come where they don't have any trust, no trust for the government or anything that imposed by the government. So it requires a lot of convincing and, and it's very important language barriers. And there's no, they're not going to go something you go online or read it. You have to literally have a find out people that can talk to them and directly they trust. So those are two challenges that we're facing in the black community overall. Um, and that needs to be addressed and, and work with it, especially if you don't work with people that they trust, then you're not gonna be able to, to back into this community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Musay. And I think your sentiment is um, being addressed in the chat as well from several other VAC members. So if you folks, have a quick chance to glance over there. I know we only have a couple more minutes before we need to wrap up. Um, and so I acknowledge that um, those those comments are also in the chat regarding vaccine hesitancy. I, I also want to say that I see Sean has a comment about um, just successful modeling and implementation of mobile testing and vaccine administration using mobile resources. So um, there's that as well. Um, as we wrap up tonight, I know that there was a lot of um, conversation around what is happening with communication to other um, uh, community groups as well, including our um, older than 65 group. And so with that, I also want to remind folks that this conversation can continue. As a VAC member, um, OHA really is ready to engage with you beyond Thursday. You know, Thursday is our uh, get to the final recommendations point. And I know um, that brings up and stirs up a lot of um, a lot of feelings um, at this point, because we know that we need to get to uh, our recommendation by th the end of the meeting Thursday. So keeping in mind that we want to continue to work with you um, at OHA. So um, thinking about how you may be a part of that conversation, whether it be with the CPOP um, team, the community outreach um, team, um, 
and then others as well. So kind of keeping those things in mind. Um, with that, I would say that tonight, um, thank you for our presenters in what you had to share with us. Um, I would like to also address that there's been um, some emails um, sent out. I would encourage folks to kind of look through some of those um, uh, resources that were sent out by other VAC members as we kind of move and shift our thoughts into how do we um, prioritize within the group of folks that we put forward the recommendation on Thursday. So I know there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you'll be getting more information from folks from this, uh, the Oregon Health Authority um, from now until we meet again on Thursday morning. So again, 6.30, thank you so much for the additional time tonight. And um, we appreciate you all so very, very much. So we'll see you 10, 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. Thank you, everyone.